Yeah. Now, Peter King from the MMQB joining us uh, in the... Uh, I, I'm calling this a man scraper instead of a skyscraper. We it's built, cute. Built it's very it. cute. Cute? Yeah. Mm. I like it. Okay. It kind of reminds me, the internal part of it reminds me of New Orleans, but the external part doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look outside, you see the Freedom Tower, Statue of Liberty, so it's a little yeah. different than, uh, what than New Orleans. What did we see last time? Strippers and bars? Uh, <laughs> strippers and $2 beers? <laughs> Best Super Bowl city is where? The city itself. It's either San Diego or New Orleans. Can you ever see a centrally located Super Bowl? You mean in just one spot? Yeah. I can't see it. It too, means too much money to too many owners. But if you, if you look at the cold weather, is this, what, what does this hinge on if we have another cold weather Super Bowl? I, you know, I think this really is an exception to the rule because I just think it's going to be so difficult for every uh, y y you know, look, if they open up the barn door, here comes Bob Kraft. Come to Boston. Here comes Steve Bishotti. Baltimore, it's great in the Inner Harbor. Dan Snyder, Jeff Lurie in Philadelphia. Uh, you know, Dan Rooney in Pittsburgh. Pat Bolin in Denver. Paul Allen in Seattle. Now, Seattle is an intriguing place because the weather would, would be 40s rainy, but it wouldn't, and so it would be kind of misery in the su in the winter because that's what it is. You know, it's too bad the Super Bowl can't be played in like mid June because <laughs> Seattle in mid June is like the best city in the world. You know, <laughs> how about if you win a Super Bowl, you get a Super Bowl? Uh, that's interesting, but no, I'm not in favor of it. I mean, look, I think the one thing about, I mean, there's two things about having the Super Bowl here that to me I just have never liked. One is that you've got about 65,000 people. For, first of all, people are going to watch it on TV if it's played in Antarctica. It doesn't matter. So you've got 65,000 people who are going to pay from, I guess, 800 to about 5,000 to sit outside and you don't just get to a Super Bowl and you're outside for three and a half hours. You have to get there two and a two half, hours. three hours before the game because of the long security lines and everything. And the games are four hours long because of the 35-minute halftime show. So then you ask yourself, is it really fair to have people be outside for seven hours in, in, in what could be really bad weather? And I also think that if you're trying to uh, contest the biggest game in your sport, you probably want to have it so that it's fairly good playing conditions. And a lot of times in the winter, it's not very good playing conditions. What is the storyline this week, the overriding one? I mean, the football storyline is Manning against the best secondary in football. I mean, the guy who's just had the best season ever for a quarterback against clearly the best secondary by far. Um, and I think that is going to be just simply fantastic to watch. And, Dan, there are eight defensive backs on the Seattle Seahawks. Peyton Manning has never played one of them, except in a preseason game. Manning has not played the Seahawks since October 4, 2009. So, I mean, Richard Sherman was playing at Stanford then, Cam Chancellor at Virginia Tech. So... I mean, that to me is is really interesting. But sort they of the haven't played against him. They haven't played they against haven't, him either. They haven't played against him. He hasn't played against them. Who does that advantage? I would say Manning, but, you know, talking a little bit to, to Sherman about it, I think what's interesting is that, you know, he believes that Manning has not faced their height and size and length and speed. And, you know, he's probably right all in all. Why did this story have legs for this amount of time, Richard Sherman? Well, because the Super Bowl dead week is a dead week, and you have to invent stuff anyway. And I think it also was the perfect storm of what people are interested in today in America. There's 56 million people at the climax of that game, and 15 seconds later, I think it was about, it was like between 15 and 30 seconds after the clock went to zero, Aaron Andrews grabs uh, Sherman, and he's screaming. And it leads into questions about sportsmanship, about race, about just winning with class, all those things. And there's nothing going on for the next week, so everybody can talk about it. 
I mean, CNN can talk about it. Everybody can talk about it. I think it just fed into something that everybody can understand. We had Jeff Fisher on last week. He's part of the competition committee. We talked about the extra point. I mean, we talked about a variety of things, adding right. another wild card team. It sounded as if Jeff was saying this extra point, as far as he's concerned, not going away, that he has no problem keeping it and you know doesn't see the owners looking at this or coaches and saying we want to get rid of this. Dan, you know what this is? This is exactly what... Uh, nearly a generation ago, instant replay was. Remember, there was this little drumbeat. Yeah. You know, you've got technology, you ought to use it. And for three, four, five years, people talked about it. And then finally it got passed, and now it's increasing in its significance. It's the same thing with the extra point. The extra point is not going to change for 2014. Probably not changing for 2015 either. I think it'll change around 2017 or 18 because in the NFL, you have, as the 32 owners, guys who basically are very conservative people and who have to be pushed and convinced that something is really wrong. There is something wrong with, with the extra point. Every 200 of them, there's 199 that are made. If you were starting an athletic contest and you said, let's make something that's competitive. And you said, okay, every 200 of these, 199 are going to go one way and one is going to go the other way. Who would do that? The fact is the current way of scoring in the NFL was made up in 1912. So because we did something one way 102 years ago, should we still do it this way today? It drives me crazy when people say, oh, it isn't broken, don't fix it. You'd say that about 9,000 things in our society. If something isn't broken, don't fix it. Or, oh, the NFL's got bigger problems. Of course they do, and they're going to try to solve them. This is not a, a, such a monumental thing that you shouldn't change it. It, ought, it should have been changed five years ago. He's Peter King. The website is the MMQB.com. Joining us here in our uh, New York studios. Um, also wondering what they do vote on this year when the competition committee gets I think together. it's going to be a boring year. I, I, think, I think, Dan, that there may be a vote uh, about uh, what I would call the Navarro Bowman play. Navarro Bowman clearly has possession of a fumble at the one-yard line. There's a pile, and he gets the ball ripped off because his knee is shredded. You know, when he can't hold on to it, he's screaming down there. So, and the officials didn't see it. So I think that there's going to be a lot of discussion and quite possibly a change in ruling uh, fumbles, especially fumbles where there are for lack of a better term, you know, piles. If it's obvious, blatantly obvious, before everybody starts piling on, I, I mean, I think there's going to be discussion about changing that rule and allowing that to be reviewed. Jeff Fisher also talked about that you you know, may get this extra uh, playoff spot, another wild card spot in both conferences. He said, but, you know, nobody's talked about the seeding process here with, you know, who gets a bye? If you win your division, are you getting a, a bye now? No. He, he said, you know, that, that, that's a concern here for the coaches. Here's what I think is going to happen if they go to a seventh playoff team. What they'll do is there will be one bye in each conference. The number one seed will get the bye. Two will play seven, three, six, and four, five. And to me, the biggest change, Dan, is going to be, you know, and I've talked to several owners and a lot of the TV, the people who are very interested in, in making TV better, Dan, I really think there, there's a good chance there's going to be a Monday night game on Wild Card Weekend. And what they'll do then is they'll say, whoever plays on Monday, you cannot play until the following Sunday. Because now, as you, you, know, you think of it, there can be teams that play on Sunday and then play the following Saturday. Because the biggest complaint in playing on Monday is that, well, then you could, you know, you could only have six days before your next game. Well, three times in the last two years, there have been a team. There have been six days between teams playing playoff games. Um, it happened with the Ravens last year when they won the Super Bowl. They went and they beat on the road the Denver Broncos basically on five days rest because they played Sunday against the Colts at home and then they played Saturday in Denver. 
And so, I mean, honestly, I don't think it's that big a deal, and I think the NFL is going to take advantage of another primetime game. Yeah, I do too. Uh, before I let you go, did you, did you make your Super Bowl pick? I picked Denver 27-24. I just I think that the Seattle secondary is going to make a lot of plays. I just think, and, and I think Cam Chancellor could erase, uh, you know, Julius Thomas and Demarius Thomas if he plays opposite Richard Sherman all game. He could get semi erased too. But I just think you, you might bring in an Andre Caldwell in five wide formations or a Jacob Tammy in five receiver formations. Both of those guys Manning absolutely loves. You can't cover everybody. Good to see you, Pete. No, you got a busy week. Thank you. The website's the MMQB.com. You can read uh, Peter's column today, as you should every uh, Monday morning. It's must read.